Welcome to the Reason Roundtable podcast, the libertarian podcast brought to you by the magazine that's been always looking on the bright side of life for more than a half century now. I am Matt Welch, joined by Nick Gillespie, Peter Suderman, and Catherine Mangu Ward. Happy Eclipse Day, everyone. Howdy. Hello, Matt. Happy Monday. Uh, Catherine, what kind of uh, teaching moment are you going to do at today's uh, solar blotting out of the sun? You know, we've talked about this before. I'm a rockets girl, not a planets girl. And you might argue that those are the same, but I would argue that they're importantly different. Like, I'm going to enjoy the eclipse, but it, like if people didn't make it, I'm just not that interested. And this is kind of the ultimate people didn't make it event. Uh, Peter, is But people are of... making it an event. True. Yeah. By gathering and celebrating. There's a communal spirit. I think I'll be encouraging uh, Reason staffers to look directly at the sun. <laughs> yeah. without Which ones? The glasses. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> you know, most mutations are uh, positive, right? This is what sure. we learned from the Marvel Universe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Peter, did you uh, organize a cocktail before the eclipse? Not even close. I think I'm actually just going to stay inside and watch Apocalypto, which has a great eclipse yeah. scene. Uh, oh. uh, at the same moment, I believe that the human sacrifice sequence is, is happening. It's it's great. Maybe it's at the Nick, end of the movie. It's been a while. Nick, are you going to unduct tape your windows finally? No. Why would I? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. What? what How can it like? get darker, Matt? How could it possibly get any darker? All right. Uh, we are going to actually do a podcast here and get into the fragile state of U.S.-Israeli uh, relations here in a moment. But first, friends, has global instability and market volatility got you looking for a more stable type of coin to diversify your investment portfolio with? Well, CSN Mint has got some shiny silver stuff for you. CSN Mint, one of the most trusted names in the coin industry, has been providing certified U.S. Mint collectible coins and precious metals for over 20 years. They're particularly bullish right now on silver, uh, which is trading way below its all-time highs and has all kinds of industrial applications, electronics, solar panels, and what have you. CSN Mint can offer you coins, bullion bars, collectibles, all with certificates of authentication, is that a word? Uh, graded by a third-party professional for purity and origin. If you're going to collect something, might as well be money. So uh, go to csnmint.com slash roundtable. Use the promo code roundtable to get a free silver American Eagle. That's a $30 value if you uh, purchase $75 or more worth of goods at the site. That's csnmint.com slash roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. Okay. Uh, the past week may have been the worst in decades for the special relationship between the United States and Israel. It started or kind of accelerated from where it was already kind of going with the Israeli Defense Forces firing three times at and killing seven aid workers from a convoy delivering food to besieged Gaza by the World Central Kitchen run by Jose Andres, President uh, Joseph Robinette Biden II. A personal friend of Jose Andres uh, said he was outraged and heartbroken uh, over the killing and in a tense phone call with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on Thursday said kind of sort of for the first time that um, if uh, future U.S. military aid to Israel could be conditioned on the way that Israel uh, behaves in the prosecution of the war, the allowance for deliveries uh, of aid into Gaza and uh, further uh, civilian casualties, concrete steps to try to uh, limit uh, further civilian uh, casualties as Israel continues to attempt to get its more than 100 hostages back and to drive Hamas from power in Gaza. Catherine, we just passed the six-month anniversary of the October 7th massacre and mass kidnapping event. Uh, and it seems like Israel is the one that's now kind of uh, isolated diplomatically on the world stage, including reportedly being in the crosshairs of a potential retaliatory uh, retaliatory it's, it's too early for words. Uh, attacked by Iran uh, after uh, Israel had sent some uh, rockets into Syria. What, in your view, uh, concretely should an American president be doing vis-a-vis -vis our closest ally in the Middle East? Yeah, I mean, I think the problem here is that the right answer is a very unpalatable answer. Um, so the right answer is not all that much one way or the other. And I know that that is deeply infuriating to um, virtually everyone 
actually. Um, there are There is a lot at stake. And of course, there are complicated pre-existing relationships and commitments. But um, I think it has actually been largely admirable that Biden has um, shown some restraint in terms of um, making these type of threats. I don't think what he did um, this time around was terribly inappropriate because it was relatively small scale, right? Like he he kind of said the smallest small admonition that he could formally say. And um, this was a really big screw up. Like by all accounts, this was, um, this was, yeah, I, I will say actually, by all accounts, this was uh, a mistake. And I, I think it's weird that people are getting super aggro about trying to prove that it was uh, on purpose. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. I can't understand a world in which Israel was like, yeah, we're going to bomb Jose Andres. Like, that would be flatly insane. Um, so I, I do want to say I think it was a mistake and I think it was correct of Biden to treat it as a terrible mistake, but one that had process and structural roots that Israel could be addressing. Nick, uh, your favorite senator and your senator, uh, Chuck Schumer. Of yeah, the not Killer. my senator, Matt Welch. Maybe yours. <laughs> uh, he gave a major speech uh, about three weeks ago on the Senate floor. He's always described himself as the best friend of Israel, even a protector of Israel. Um, but he said uh, that Benjamin Netanyahu was one of four major obstacles to peace in the Middle East and said that basically what Israel needs to do right now is to hold new elections to replace said obstacle. Is that uh, uh, the, the right approach for American policymakers to make? Um, are we uh, focusing over much uh, or the right amount on Netanyahu himself? I don't think it's generally appropriate for a U.S. Uh, president, much less a senator or congressman, to start uh, talking about you know, who should be running what country, especially if they're an ally, uh, which Israel is. We have treaties and things like that with them. And they're in an active war situation. It doesn't seem to me to be very helpful. It is telling. I think Biden was, uh, you know, Biden is right to critique or to, you know, call out allies uh, when they're doing something that needs to be either addressed or corrected or something like that. That's not the same thing as saying, you know what, you need to get some, you know, we need a different town council in Tel Aviv and you better get that streetlight working or anything like that. These are very different things. I think the most interesting thing coming out of uh, recent events was the big uh, Biden fundraiser at Radio City Music Hall uh, recently that featured, you know, million or hundred thousand dollar photo opportunities with ex-presidents and all of that kind of stuff. Biden said going in that he is working to, uh, you know, to get Saudi Arabia, among other countries in the region, to recognize the right of Israel to exist. That gives me hope. That got, that got washed over because he said he's working to get Egypt and Jordan, two countries that have recognized the right of Israel to exist for decades now, you know, famously. Um, uh, people were saying that this is a sign of his cognitive decline. But in fact, if he is working to get Saudi Arabia and other key Arab countries in the Middle East to recognize Israel and produce a united front, both against Israel, but also Syria and Lebanon and other countries that border Israel that don't recognize its right to exist, and to kind of block Iran from being a regional player in the Middle East, that strikes me as good. And that's the thing that gives me the most hope out of recent events, is the idea that the U.S., may actually be working towards a diplomatic solution uh, that will keep the United States out of the area, um, you know, which we should we should not be engaging militarily in any uh, you know, significant way, but also would bring the region uh, some stability and a future where the countries who are actually there and are going to be there for the long haul are working together in some kind of peaceable uh, uh, fashion. Peter, Nick just mentioned Egypt and Jordan. Uh, and uh, and recognizing Israel's right to exist. Part of that recognition process and America's diplomacy process has been to give the Egypts and the Jordans a ton of money, lots of weapons too. Um, libertarians tend to be like, hey, we should maybe stop arming all the people who are shooting each other and who suck like Saudi Arabia, although Nick loves the House of Saud apparently. But um, I don't. Um, and I understand the impulse, and it's correct in 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 almost every respect. And yet, that is our leverage, is it not? Um, is there something kind of incoherent of saying, 
hey, America, you need to pressure Israel more. And hey, America, you need to stop arming people. I think foreign policy is never going to be fully coherent. It is the area of uh, of policy in which it is hard to develop and maintain a perfectly consistent, perfectly ri- rigorous theory of the case and then actually act on it practically. And just, you know, you look at the situation and there are no great options, or at the very least, there are trade-offs. Uh, quite clear trade-offs with every possible option. So with Israel or with any of the other countries who we have been uh, arming or funding or sort of um, giving some sort of uh, aid to, right? You know, if you pull your funding completely, then you, you you lose your influence, right? Because there's there's only after after it's gone, then what do you what do you have older over those countries, right? What can you say? Well, I want you to do this because. We've got billions of aid coming to you. Uh, and if that billions isn't coming anymore, then there's no there's no more leverage. Um, on the other hand, you keep your funding in place and you become complicit. You are participating in whatever awfulness, uh, possibly even encouraging it or making it easier, You know, ma- uh, making it more likely because you're providing more money for more guns and more bombs and more atrocities. Um, and then even if you condition your funding, even if you say, well, we're going to give you this money, but we're going to put rules on this. Then what do you have? Then you have a situation. Then you have a situation in which you are, it, it looks an awful lot like you are meddling in the affairs of other countries, um, trying to basically run their governments. Uh, and and especially, you know, with a Schumer speech that you mentioned with Israel, right? Like, it just looks like the, the United States thinks these are sort of quasi-territories of the U.S. and we're acting in a sort of imperial way, right? So there's, there's just not a great way to go about this. I think there's... Um, I think it would be great if there were philosophical consistency uh, throughout the international relations. I just don't think that that's at all going to happen because it is inherently messy. It's ugly and it's messy. And especially where there's a war involved, you're, there's not going to be a, a, a clean, easy, smart solution that just works and produces the results that you want. I think it's important not to uh, you know, assume that there's equivalency between all uh, foreign, uh, you know, foreign interventions that the United States makes, whether they're selling weapons or having a defense uh, treaty or invading a country. You know, what we did in Iraq is categorically different than supporting Israel after it has been attacked by a group that is the governing authority in Gaza that has said, we are not going to stop until Israel is wiped off the face of the earth. And it's being abetted by a series of countries, Iran most obviously, which says Israel does not have a right to exist. We want to exterminate all Jews, not just from the Middle East, but from the planet. Uh, You know, unless we are going to be fully isolationist, which would also mean, I assume, that we would never give certain countries better trading terms than other countries and things like that, you know, then we're in a world of of trade-offs. And when we start looking at that, you know, there are better and worse things to do. And I think supporting Israel, not militarily, but uh, supporting Israel as it tries to make sure that, you know, Hamas is not capable of, you know, uh, you know, killing the what would be the equivalent of about 30,000 Americans uh, in attack, attack, attack. I think that's a good thing. I think Iran is a bad actor. We are certainly complicit in the rise of the theocracy in Iran. Uh, because we shouldn't have we shouldn't have deposed the government that was democratically elected in Iran in the 50s. But it does not mean that the only the only possible solution is to say, OK, we can't do anything. So we pull out. Um, I think uh, I think uh, I'm just saying I think an attempt to try and bring diplomat diplomatic solutions and regional alliances that make sense for both the region and the larger cl- world, including America. That's not a bad thing. You just said uh, a no military aid to Israel. Does that include the Iron Dome? No, I said intervention. Okay, I, th- I thought you said yeah. aid, um, yeah. which is a l- little bit. I different. mean, I don't I, think you know. We we can also make a, a difference. There's something different between Ukraine defending itself, you know, uh, an internationally recognized country which we don't have treaties with, but we do recognize its right to exist. You know, uh, uh, Ukraine defending itself against uh, Putin is different than Russia invading Ukraine, right? Morally. Yes. And I think our responses to that are going to be different based on those differences. Catherine, um, uh, Peter was talking about how solutions are messy and uh, filled with trade-offs. 
Um, so let's have you trade off uh, here on a solution that's always mentioned by Americans and not really by Israelis, which is the uh, ever elusive two state solution. We've seen uh, President Biden, Chuck Schumer, um, everybody, every American president, for the most part, um, uh, says this is necessary. And whenever things get even more um, uh, tense and uh, and bloody in the Middle East, they say it even louder. Is it a bit of a non sequitur to talk about a two-state solution from an American point of view right now, considering how uh, uh, Israelis own priorities and sense of things? Or is that precisely when we should be telling our friends that it's important to think about a two-state solution on their borders? I think the two-state solution talk sounded more practical and more reasonable in other moments in other times. And of course, it often is the way that conflicts between nations are resolved, right? I mean, this is this is a very standard operating procedure. It's like, okay, we're going to fight over a chunk of land for a while and eventually divvy it up in some way. Like this is, this is not a crazy proposal. Um, that said, I, I think what you're alluding to is right, Matt, which is that it is impossible for me to imagine that Joe Biden repeating the phrase two state solution right now is doing one single thing to move that part of the world toward peace. It's just it's just a thing to say because we have to have a thing to say because we established it as our preferred solution at some point and we don't have a we don't have a way to improve on it. Um, and I think this is you know we were talking about the difference in our kind of moral evaluation and maybe also in our foreign policy stance with respect to um, defensive action. And, you know, I think it's been very interesting that in uh, in Israel, this is like part of the fight is a fight over who is acting in defense of themselves. Right. This has been this has been a, a big ongoing part of the conversation as well. Is, you know, is Israel waging defensive action here after having been you know, attacked? Um, or is the long history of this region a, a long history of Israeli occupation? And it's the Palestinians who are who are in the defensive position because so many people share this moral intuition that whoever has been attacked is in the right. Um, it becomes a kind of battle to be perceived as the one who is attacked. And I, I don't think that that rubric is helpful here either. So we have this kind of hand wavy two state thing. We have this, no, no, it is me who has been attacked thing. And um, I think both of those debates felt like there could have been movement on them in the 90s, for example, and they don't now. They feel they feel totally locked in and locked down to me. So when you're judging what Joe Biden is saying, it's worth remembering that he's not just speaking to a, an audience uh, that consists of players in the Middle East, of Israel and the countries around it. He's also speak, speaking to a domestic political audience. And Democrats really do have a, a big incentive. Joe Biden in particular has a very large incentive to make this conflict go away and get it off of the front pages uh, as soon as possible, uh, preferably by the summer, because right now it is splitting the Democratic coalition here in the United States and proving... Uh, at, at least a moderate sized, if not a major headache for the Democratic Party going into the election. And I, I think you can't discount that as a as a, a goal um, that Joe Biden has when he's speaking about this stuff. And so when he says he wants a two state solution and when he's talking, you know, when he makes uh, stern phone calls to you know leaders in Israel, he's talking to Israel. Yes, that's what he's doing. But he's also talking to Democrats here and trying to make sure that he plays the part that he wants to be seen playing. That analysis, though, is the very reason why, you know, my initial answer to this question was and is always the U.S. should just be less involved. Like, of course, there is a theoretical world where we could do the perfect diplomatic intervention. Uh, many, many presidents, U.S. presidents have labored under the delusion that they can do that correctly. But in the end, their priorities are not actual peace in the Middle East for its own sake. Their priorities are win an election. Their priorities are talk to the Democratic base. Their priorities are a million other things. And so if we are asking for the U.S. to be a leader, a world leader in these matters, we have to recognize that this will always, always, always be true, that it's just us doing domestic electoral politics in a in an extremely high stake situation, a life and death situation for other people. Libertarians I, declare there are trade-offs to all solutions. 
to all policies, right? Yeah, like breaking this is, details at eleven. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's it's also true that the the accords that the U.S. helped broker uh, between Israel and Egypt and Jordan have been have been good things. I think for you know for the world and for the region. I agree with you. D- foreign policy is almost always a uh, an extension of domestic policy. I said this at the time, and I still believe it that the reason why the U.S. invaded Iraq in two thousand three was because Bush needed that from a domestic point of view. There was no connection uh, you know, to getting bin Laden or stopping another 9-11, which is what we were supposed to be doing with the global war on terror. Uh, Matt, I know you are fond of saying that the, Je- the October 6th status quo in Israel was not tenable, and I think that's right. And that goes back to questions of whether it's a two-state solution or something else. When the, uh, you know, when the war is over, and there are legitimate questions to be asking about Netanyahu's plan, which he's kind of laid out for when it will be over, or when Israel says, okay, hostilities are over, there will need to be something that is different than what existed before October 7th. Um, and it may be that the U.S. can help play a role in brokering a deal that actually brings peace and some stability to the region for some level. It may be that we shouldn't have anything to do with that whatsoever. But that's a different question than saying, you know, whether or not the U.S. can be more or less helpful right now. A couple of uh, just follow-on points. One, about the sort of crass domestic politics of it all. You find in most of the news articles, just straight pieces about Biden, White House, wrestling with the issue. There'll be a paragraph or two like, and this is very important because Michigan is a swing state and there's a lot of Americans there. And so Biden wants to signal to them that he's on their team so that he can win the election. And it's like, I, ah. Um, you know, one state, one group, uh, one contested election um, affecting the uh, decision making process of a, a once great country is uh, pretty interesting uh, and strange. The other thing that I keep getting echoes of, um, uh, Nick, you mentioned Radio City Music Hall. There was, as there is on every single Biden event basically now, there was at least one or a couple, I think, protesters inside. I paid a lot of money to protest, <laughs> apparently, to get in there. Um, and they're dogging him at every live event. And it reminds me a lot of Arnold Schwarzenegger's first term as governor, um, the California Nurses Association and other uh, labor heavies there um, went to every single event. If he was uh, at his middle school daughter's graduation, and that might not be exactly right, but it's somewhere close. Um, there was going to be like 15 or 30 agro nurses chanting Schwarzenegger sucks or whatever, and and uh, and waving banners because he had taken on the public sector unions in California. Was that a huge part of public opinion? Much less so probably than um, than uh, uh, upset at Israel right now is an, a live issue, especially for Democrats. Although Americans are are souring on Israel's prosecution of the war per Gallup, but um, Schwarzenegger saw it and felt it every day, and it affected him. And I, I have a feeling that Biden. The staff, the White House, you know, 25 year olds duct taping their mouths in front of of Capitol Hill They're or resigning, whatever. Resigning, right? From various well, ages. A couple resigning, yeah. So yeah. like it's in the 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 social physical space of the president. And it's probably getting to him, um, is is uh, my guess. It's just a guess. All right, let's move on. Can we before we yes. move on, can we have like one second on Jose Andres? Because yes. I feel like this has reminded me of how incredibly cool World Central Kitchen is. And uh, it's it's so libertarian. It's just like such a story. I mean, we've told this story many times, uh, but he is just a dude that was like, hey, right after disasters, people are hungry. What if we just didn't do this the stupid way? And, you know, he's a comp- he's a direct competitor to FEMA. He's a direct competitor to major global aid organizations that are supported by and facilitated by world governments. And um, I was just listening to um, The Daily, uh, which, you know, have your have your debates with it or whatever. But they did a really nice episode that the first half of it was just the story of this venture by Jose Andres. And one thing they noted is that in the disasters that he stepped up for in the U.S., um, the reason that he was so successful is because the FEMA regulations on food aid had become so burdensome, including you have to have a bottle of water of a certain size in every food aid box or else you are not allowed to distribute food aid. And he was just like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) 
here, I made you some beans. And everyone was like, yay, he's a hero. Like, and he is a hero. So I, I think this is just like a good moment, even though a dark one, to remember that the efforts that they are that they are putting in are di- you know, in direct competition with governments that cannot get their shit together to help people who need the help the most. Um, and he's just a guy who knows a bunch of other guys who have like a slight adrenaline addiction. And so he's like, what if all these stupid chefs could be put to use? And I love that. Uh, also, great cocktails. If you ever go to one of his establishments, have a margarita with salt air. It's like this foamy salt air stuff that they put on top of their margaritas. It's That's incredible. what the Gazans really need right now. They probably do, yeah. TBH. Um, they need a lot of things, this, but that too. It's also worth remembering that uh, this should, you know, this entire situation should be yet one more chit against the U, uh, the United Nations, uh, which has actually been overseeing all sorts of stuff in Gaza, including uh, relief, and is just a completely incompetent agency, um, a government, and particularly in Gaza, where something like ten percent of its uh, of its members were involved in Hamas. So it's you know. Uh, there should it, it would be a better world where Jose Andres's uh, uh, you know intervention is not necessary, but uh, it's a it's a reminder it be a of better world where what's it's the actually only going one. on. Not well, you you also can compare him. Uh, people like him. I think there's also a sort of a funny but useful comparison to what Russia has in the Wagner Group, which was started by Prigozhin. Prigo, Prig, can I ever say that name? I'm so correctly? nervous about the Eric Jose Prigozhin. Andres and, is, is no, secretly the and, no, no, no. He's he's the good version, right? Because the Wagner Group was started by a former restaurant entrepreneur, oh, somebody who true. who was who made his who made his uh, his name and his wealth um, with a restaurant empire. And one guy put it to use uh, with a private army, and the other one put it to use feeding people in in desperate need of food um that's a uh, a teaser for a reference to some oligarchs that we'll have later in the program um but for now let's continue on the theme of of how much we love uh, the federal government because um <laughs> next monday is tax day everyone amen and pass the ammo um peter i'm old enough to remember when uh it was i think to 2022 well, i think it was the summer 2022, uh, when uh, Democrats in Congress gave the IRS 80 billion with a B dollars to hire allegedly 87,000 new enforcement officers and swore up and down that for sure none of that would go towards uh, uh, auditing anyone except for the rich people. Um, I think Janet Yellen used the word misinformation to talk about those of us who were at the time saying, that's not how it's going to work. Um, that's and- just a single lady who, you know, she works with misinformation. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> wow. Would you face. care, uh, Mr. Suderman, <laughs> to in between your just machine gun of puns, your machine puns, uh, uh, inform no. the class uh, on how and why a new inspector general report from the Treasury Department has exposed the Janet Yellens of the world and her handmaidens in the MSM as being a bunch of dirty dog liars. Uh, yeah, so you can call me Mr. Information. And I want to start with the $80 billion number because $80 billion is so much money. Let's just go back to where this money comes from. This is part of the Inflation Reduction Act. And the idea <laughs> was that... No one even thinks, even Biden at this point, like he's going around saying, yeah, it's not really about uh, inflation, right? There's a great quote from him about a year afterwards. It's like, you know, the biggest chunk of this money, actually what it's really about, it's not about inflation. It doesn't have anything to do with inflation. It's about investing in clean energy. Well, it's also about investing in IRS revenue agents. Now, uh, some of this has gotten blown out of proportion. There was some rumor that they were going to hire like 87,000 armed agents. That is not correct. But this money was intended to hire a whole bunch of additional revenue agents who are supposed to focus on enforcement. And the, the pitch was, we're going to catch rich tax cheats. 
millionaires and billionaires who are not paying enough on their taxes. And there's all of this money that is that is not being paid, the tax gap. And so what the, the idea was, uh, the reason that this made it into the Inflation Reduction Act is that this was going to be a deficit reducer because there's so much unpaid tax money out there from really, really rich people. Well, the problem with really, really rich people is, first of all, uh, they already uh, pay a lot in taxes. Two, they have lawyers and other resources. And three, there's not actually all that many of them. But you know who there are a lot of? People who aren't that rich, people who make less than a million or really people who make less than $200,000 a year. And so the latest TikTok report shows that the uh, about two thirds, the, the majority of uh, new audits that have come uh, in the aftermath of this new spending uh, have been targeting people who make less than $200,000 a year and 80% have been targeting people who make less than a million dollars a year. Now, if you make $200,000 or you make eight or $900,000 a year, you are not exactly poor, but this is not the we're only only going to target the super rich argument that the Biden administration consistently made. The other thing that you see in that report that's really kind of interesting is they're not meeting their hiring goals. And this is one of the things uh, this is like a, a notable part of this is they're not able to actually find the people to go and do the enforcement here. And so who do you end up targeting when you don't have a whole bunch of new professionals? You end up targeting uh, the, the easy people to get to, which are the middle class folks who you can just harass, uh, who you can just spend a lot of time um, trying to pick up more money from. And this is this is a pattern. This is not a one-off, one-year thing. If you go back to the previous year, uh, I will just read you a headline from Liz Wolf uh, that uh, ran in Re uh, Reason.com in January of 2023. In 2022, the IRS went after the very poorest taxpayers. And there's just uh, there's just a whole bunch of audits going after people, not even the, the $200,000 earners, but people who are making much less than that. And that is a consistent pattern here. Whenever you give the IRS more money and you promise that it's only gonna, uh, that it's only gonna result in audits of rich people, the middle class and the not even middle class end up getting hit pretty hard. You know, part of that is also the earned income tax credit. If you, if you claim that, uh, this is a payment uh, or a program which goes to lower income people by, by design. And there's also an error rate of up to 30% in a given year where the, uh, you know, where payments are going out to the wrong people. And they're among the, the top people. If you claim the EITC, that's one of the biggest flags for an audit, which also doesn't mean an agent showing up at your door, but it means you get a follow-up question or set of questions. And in a weird way, that makes sense because that is one of the most misbegotten or, or misappropriated programs that's out there. And it's pretty popular. Catherine, as you hurtle towards middle age, um, what is your current uh, biggest uh, irritation at uh, uh, tax season? Oh, God. Um, I mean, to be honest, it has nothing to do with middle age. It has nothing to do with the complexity of my taxes. It's it's just the baseline rage, Matt. It's just the very, very simple taxation is theft rage that blinds me whenever I try to there sit down to do the taxes. Um, but if I'm giving like a slightly less bonkers answer, I guess it's <laughs> it's um, you know, it's also this sense that like I'm pretty smart and I'm pretty good at paperwork. And I should be able to do this. And the gap between things I personally could actually do on my taxes and what needs to be done is so substantial that I have to pay someone else to do it. That's the real tax gap. It's the real tax. So, I mean, this is, you know, um, in the in the um, the plan to to hire all of these new agents and in particular to hire agents who can who either have the seniority or the private sector experience to process audits for wealthy people um like the the reason that they that the irs can't hire these people is because that's a really really hard job and the reason it's really really hard is because our tax code is so complex and also because the irs is so backwards technologically um, and i think that's a piece of this that it's like really easy to underestimate in a lot of other industries right now we are replacing expensive labor with technology. And that is impossible to do at the IRS because they are still trying to, you know, modernize their computer systems that are like microfilm based. And uh, so it's it's the rage is the problem, Matt, but also it I don't like it that it makes me feel stupid. My rage is that um, um, 
like Nick Gillespie, I pay New York City income taxes. Ooh. City income taxes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and like if you live here um, and you look around and ask yourself, hmm, what are the things that work well and what are the things that don't? The things that are managed by the city is the answer to the second question. It, like if you drive into town as soon as you get in, in like, welcome to the Bronx, kathunk, kathunk, kathunk. <laughs> <laughs> the roads are so terrible. You've got those so safe, terrible. clean subways, though, and you've got the uh, you, you've got the trash piles. Yes. Um, anyways, uh, let's uh, let's get to our listener email of the week uh, in a moment here. But first, a reminder that this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Friends, what's the first thing you would do if you had an extra hour each day? Maybe mix in some sit-ups, memorize the Book of Job. Reorganize your triplicate team baseball card set of the 1964 Los Angeles Angels. Um, well, uh, therapy can actually help you prioritize things that are important to you so that time becomes less of an excuse for you to procrastinate instead of finishing your long overdue assignments. That's where BetterHelp Online Therapy comes in. BetterHelp is an easy to use, super flexible, entirely online therapy service that has helped many listeners of this podcast clean up brain clutter in order to boldly face life's actually important challenges. All you have to do is fill out a quick questionnaire, get matched with a therapist, and if you don't like the first one, just swap them out for a second. Let therapy help you extend the effectiveness of your days. With BetterHelp, just visit betterhelp.com slash roundtable right now to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash roundtable. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. Uh, all right, reminder to email your short queries, please, to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from Dakota B in Charleston, SC, who writes, Greetings, Roundtable. The recent article in Reason by Lenore Skenazy, the pupil panopticon, reminded me of the panopticonism, I did it, of Michel Foucault. I think many of Foucault's ideas are libertarian leaning, even if his overall politics were not libertarian. Are there any other thinkers not traditionally associated with libertarianism that the roundtable can identify as having some libertarian views? I first heard of Foucault because I am a sociology major. Hold your scoffs, especially you, Mr. English PhD Gillespie. And most of my cohorts do not seem open to libertarian ideas, but I think suggestions of thinkers that you consider left-leaning, but also hold libertarian ideas that could help expose non-libertarians to libertarianism, unlike what many of my classmates would assume, the government is not always the answer to social problems. Love, reasoned, and the roundtable. Thank you, Dakota B. Nick, you were name checked. Uh, how do you yep. answer this question? Uh, one uh, is that the uh, the letter writer is absolutely correct, and it, regarding Foucault himself, I recommend uh, the book that came out a couple of years ago called "The Last Man Takes LSD," which is about Foucault. And his political commitments in 1970s and early 80s France, where he teamed up with Gustard d'Estaing's uh, right of center government to do things like uh, stop uh, homosexuality from being illegal in France, changing divorce laws, and doing uh, penal reform, uh, actual prison work, and things like that. Foucault has many things to answer for. Arguably, the, the dumbest was his embrace of the uh, Islamic Revolution in Iran in the in the late seventies, which is almost exactly a word for word kind of uh transliteration of Murray Rothbard's terrible um piece in Reason uh called The Death of a State, where he uh you know he was in full uh luxuriant foam at the at the uh end of South Vietnam. Uh because he said anytime a state ends anywhere, we should be celebrating, even if it means it's going to be overrun by uh, kind of tyrannical Marxist uh, nut jobs and things like that. And Foucault does something similar there. Um, but I, I would recommend people, uh, you know, and particularly uh, academics who want to try and start an engagement with the left. Um, that's that's a good place to go. In terms of sociology proper, I'm a big fan of Irving Goffman, who is not anybody's idea of a libertarian um, in, a, in a precise way, but uh, the the writer will know who he is, but in books like Frame Analysis, as well as all of his work on what became known as Total Institutions, he talked a lot in a kind of Jane Jacobs type of thing about taking, uh, looking at systems of power and control, 
as top-down mechanisms and then finding places where individuals at lower levels um, can actually find a surprising degree of autonomy or freedom. Um, that works for me. And then the other article that I would uh, recommend to everybody is the uh, 1978, I believe, uh, cover story, France's F Philosophical Superstars, which talks about people like Bernard-Henri Lévy as well as Foucault, but um, Jacques Lacan, who uh, is a uh, French psychoanalyst, uh, comes in as one of the kind of people who helped uh, inspire a bunch of anti-statist philosophers coming out of the uh, 1968 student revolutions there. Uh, Lacan now is mostly known uh, through his association with uh, Slavo Žižek, who is nobody's idea of a libertarian. Um, but that's a starting point. Catherine, who's your non-libertarian, preferably left-leaning people? I will definitely uh, second Nick's recommendation that you check out Reason's um, Francis Philosophical Superstars cover, not least because of the just catastrophic amount of Bernard-Henri Lévy chest that appears. Just the unbuttoned shirt of it all uh, alone is really worth the cost of admission, which is which is zero because you can read it for free on our website. He's like half Amish, right? Like yeah. they don't believe in using buttons or zippers. Yeah, that's Après the problem. Après le chemise, c'est moi. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, uh, have talked about this on the podcast before, but I have a little weird soft spot for Henry George. And I think that he, like, he's disarming in a way. Um, I don't know that I would say, you know, he's, it's very hard to find words to describe Henry George and sort of the spicy little Georgists that you get on the internet. There's this, this sort of, um, it's a little a little community of people who clearly are not big on uh, labels other than their own very personal narrow one and do kind of subvert some people's strong biases on questions of private property and other matters. So maybe maybe sneak a little Henry George into your friend's diets and see how it goes. Um, if you want something a little more pop, I think um, the kind of Stuart brand cluster of humans is is a good other place to start. These are people who do not, by and large, trigger any kind of anti-libertarian sentiment. And yet the kind of whole earth catalog guys, um, especially brand, uh, have a ton to say about what it means to be free and self-sufficient and um, self-actualized in ways that are appealing to to many. Scottish science fiction author Ian M. Banks. So Ian M. Banks was a leftist who endorsed the Scottish Socialist Party and really disliked libertarians. Uh, I'll just give you a, a quote here from a Wired interview in 2012 where he uh, he ranted about greedism and marketology uh, that was being advocated by the intellectually facile, right? It really gets my hackles up, the right-wing cover of libertarianism. And he had that idea spread uh, all over his books where he was just sort of having characters that were basically a espousing his own view of the world, uh, criticized libertarianism as, for example, a simple-minded right-wing ideology ideally suited to those unable or unwilling to see past their own self-regard. So it's really, really funny that Ian M. Banks also probably portrayed, gave us the best single, the single best portrayal of a fully anarchist libertarian world. His culture series of science fiction novels takes place in the far future in a post-singularity, post-scarcity uh, universe in which the main society, the culture, has effectively no laws. The only real rule is uh, is consent. And the, the whole goal of the society is for individuals to self-actualize as much as they want, which means which means kind of anything. And it's just fascinating how far he takes this. You can live as long as you want. You can die when you want. You can copy yourself and become multiple. You can sort of, you can take the information that is yourself and put it in a little box and then come out a thousand years later. You can live life as a whale. You can switch genders at will. And in fact, he outlines all of these kind of fascinating ideas about like, well, you know, maybe people will couple up for just a little while for 50 or 100 years of their thousand year life. And and they will both, uh, they'll fall in love and it doesn't matter what gender they started, they will both become female to have the other's child and then they'll switch back to whichever one they want, right? It's just fascinatingly um, sort of clear about what it means to be 
uh, to be an individualist and to, to have a world in which people can simply pursue whatever they want and whatever they desire in the moment so long as they are not really hurting another person without that person's consent. And that, of course, is also part of this is that you can give consent to be hurt. And if you enjoy it, you know what? Uh, that's good for you. Um, and so Banks, Banks' portrayal of this deeply libertarian kind of anarchist world, uh, to the extent there is a government, it's entirely super intelligent AI. And actually, they usually kind of muck it up because governments always muck things up. It's really, whenever Catherine talks about being an anarchist, I think about the culture and Ian e M. Banks' world because Ian e M. Banks was the one who I think gave us gave us the deepest and funniest and most alive portrayal of what that society, what what a society that truly does not have laws or governments as we know them might look like and how that might, uh, you know, sort of how people might choose to act in that world. My answer to the question is visible behind my shoulder for those who are watching this on YouTube. Uh, Václav Havel, the um, uh, former playwright turned president of uh, Czechoslovakia and then the Czech Republic when that country broke in half. Um, is a uh, uh, pronounced influence on, on my life and plenty of others besides. There's a lot of people that you can describe on the individualistic uh, and anti-communist left. Um, he's ultimately classified left. Later in life, he developed uh, an outsized fondness for Hillary Clinton and would uh, take it to say such bad phrases as uh, you know market fundamentalism. Um, but uh, for the most of his career, um, he articulated a vision of uh, of individualism and the potency, um, untapped usually, of what happens when an individual decides to no longer uh, just sit around and roll with the lies of government. Um, that if uh, that basically most governments and certainly all totalitarian governments are based on enforcing. Uh, what everyone knows to be lies and forcing people to mouth them and support them. Um, the classic uh, case in uh, his um, great essay, The Power of the Powerless, um, is about uh, people putting up a sign, the, the grocer in a shop saying workers of the world unite. And he breaks down what are the possible motivations for putting out that sign and what do they mean by that phrase. Uh, and it's kind of hilarious, but it's also uh, really interesting um, he wrote this in the depths of really, really deeply totalitarian uh, communism in the 1970s in his country. Um, and in order to do that, you faced uh, abysmal consequences, spent a lot of time in jail. Um, a lot of his cohorts did as well. Um, but he accurately predicted in this thing at a time when there was nobody making predictions like that, that there will be enough people who do this and it'll uh, expose the state as being built in this tissue of lies and it'll collapse so quickly you won't even believe it. Um, and that kind of is what happened and he was part of that process. Um, but it's definitely located in the same kind of tradition, including this sort of showing your math, showing your, your mental processes as George Orwell. Uh, George Orwell, Václav Havel, even Martin Luther King too, um, were always concentrated and they were, uh, they're focused on this no notion of truth and even sort of self-purification and, and responsibility towards truth and how you have to fight that against all the powers of warping ideology and power around you. And it's very uh, galvanizing to, uh, to read all of that. Um, and it's a fun history lesson for those who don't know that particular history. The end. Um, all right. Uh, as, uh, as mentioned uh, earlier, it is Solar Eclipse Day. It's going to be over by the time most of you listen to this, I would guess. Um, let's do a quick lightning round, though. I know Catherine doesn't like the planets, um, but let's each of us talk about one cool thing related to consuming astronomy. Peter? So if you want to go watch the very first eclipse that was ever recorded on any sort of film or video, you can. And it was recorded in 1900 by a British filmmaker and magician, of course. Yes, the magic guys have always been like, a, a, I was a magic guy as a kid, right? Like how many of us, I've, I've worn the, the black shirt with the, the red tie, you know? Um, no, the magic guys are great. And he viewed photography as a way to help scientists um, and, uh, 
And he was, you know, he had actually tried in uh, 1898 to catch one um, on film, and then the footage was lost, but he managed to catch it in uh, 1900, and now you can watch that online. And in fact, if you go back through the history of the World Wide Web, eclipses kind of play a weird, like, little uh, sort of recurring character. They are like a recurring character in the history of o online stuff in this. Um, so back in uh, 1998, one of the first big popular viral live streams long before YouTube existed or watching anything live online, any kind of live video uh, was common at all. Um, there was a there was a live stream of the 1998 Aruba eclipse that got something like four million people to watch it. It was a really big deal. It was covered by local news. Um, there was also like a, a, a live in person event by the organization that put this on that got a, a couple of hundred people and it really kind of showed people the power of the web. And and what it could do to sort of to to bring people to experiences that they might not other otherwise be able to have, um, and and to be, bring, be able to to bring people together. So it's just a sort of a cool um, history of the web interact. Excuse me, of uh, um, eclipses interacting with new technologies and showing people what those technologies can do. Nick, what is your one cool thing, and why is it uh, ELO's uh, discovery? Double. Oh, Double. that would be so nice. Uh, and I actually, I was just listening to a backward masking um, uh, kind of analysis of ELO songs, uh, oh, which came up in one of my feeds. Yeah. Um, yeah. So ELO is obviously one of the most satanic bands ever. <laughs> I, you know. There's no question of that. But uh, I uh, am just going to uh, say that I really enjoyed the last Eclipse, uh, the one in 2017. And I really liked the super duper glasses that you could buy so that you could watch them. Because I grew up in the 70s when the only other thing that was more terrifying uh, than quicksand appearing everywhere and killing us all was the idea that if you stared directly into an eclipse, you would burn your eyes out. Um, and or otherwise mess them up. And I can still remember an eclipse from sometime in the early 70s where I did look directly into it and then I became convinced that I needed eyeglasses a couple of years after that, despite coming from a family of genetic losers, almost all of whom have uh, nearsightedness. I, did I you have to build eclipse. one of those eclipse boxes yeah, with which the mirror? And never the worked. We had to I don't do know. that. Yeah, I don't know what what the teachers were doing while they were making us be busy with that and putting our heads in it and stuff like that. So, and Catherine. I'm a big uh, fan of Eclipso, the one of the shittiest comic book villains of all time, which dates back to the early '60s. Catherine, you're not a planet girl, but is there anything about consuming astronomy that you find cool? If you want to share, uh, here's the best I could do. Um, I. There is a Ray Bradbury short story that I read in school, maybe around the time that I was making one of those dumb cardboard boxes that were supposed to show me the eclipse without looking at the sun. And uh, I've always associated this story with eclipses. No one else seems to remember this story. This is one of those things where in the absence of the Internet, I would assume that I had hallucinated it. But um, all summer in a day, which is a beautiful story about um uh, kind of a, the opposite, a a, mo a brief moment uh, in a uh, in a parallel civilization where uh, the sun only comes out uh, for a very short time, very rarely, and how people experience that. And um, it's also a little bit about uh, so it's like bullying. a reverse version of Isaac Asimov's Nightfall. Uh, yeah, uh, but but also not it's an at all. Answer similar. song. Um, so, All Summer in a Day by Ray Bradbury for the Eclipse vibes, but in reverse. I wish you had hallucinated it, and then it could be like Ray Bradbury's Shaq Genie movie. It's the Shazam of Ray Bradbury. Yeah, no, it's, it, yeah, it could have been, but it's real, and it's spectacular. Uh, my uh, lightning round uh, recommendation is the Sky Guide app. Point your phone at the stars, tells you what you're looking at. It's awesome. Uh, Camille Foster recommended it to me. It's fun for kids of all ages those who are engaged in micro learning. All right, let's go to our end of podcast. What we have been consuming besides astronomy in the cultural uh, strata. Uh, Nick, why don't you lead us off? Uh, I watched the series finale of uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, oh. which is, you know, uh, which started in 2000 or 1999 or 2000. 
and uh, finally gave up the ghost after 12 seasons. Uh, Larry David was obviously one of the co-creators of Seinfeld, and he famously really shit the bed on the finale, the two-part finale of Seinfeld. So this had that fascinating kind of thing. Was he going to get it right? In many ways, it's a rewrite. Curb Your Enthusiasm, in a, in a profound sense, um, is a rewrite of Seinfeld. Um, and in general, I think it's great, but it's also not as good as Seinfeld. Uh, in many ways, it can be, it's darker and deeper and certainly dirtier. But as a series, it's it's the stepchild of, of Seinfeld. And the finale was semi-satisfying, but mostly in this sense, in a way that I hope Larry David will, re- will uh, understand and come to appreciate. Um, it is another bad finale. So Larry David has been involved in two of the great TV shows of the past 50 years. And each time the finale has been kind of like a uh, bunt single, something like that. Um, but I watched that. And the other thing that's great about Curb Your Enthusiasm, and this goes back to Seinfeld, is that at the end of the 21st, uh, at the end of the 20th century, you know, there was a, a kind of face off between are you going to be Seinfeldian or are you going to be a friends watcher? This is a, a meaningful way to think about how you interpret the world and how you live in the world. And with the demise of Curb Your Enthusiasm, uh, that kind of ends a. Uh, a genre or a worldview, at least in public, uh, you know, in weekly public uh, kind of articulation. And I think we'll be, um, you know, thinking about what it means to be in a post uh, Larry David, post Seinfeld world. I think uh, my version of that is, are you um, bosom buddies uh, when they're wearing the dresses or when they got out of the dresses? And I think yep. the answer is obviously dresses. It's not even, not even close. Really. Yeah. I mean, you're either in the bit or you're not. But yeah. Uh, Catherine, what did you consider? Uh, my selection this week is designed exclusively to anger you, Matt. Thank um, you. And it is called Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. It is uh, set uh, on the Yale campus. It is a it is a fantasy novel, an adult fantasy novel, the first adult novel by someone who had previously written a very successful young adult fantasy. Um, it is uh, set in not just at Yale, but in the secret societies of Yale, and it has some kind of um, uh, like occult magic stuff in there. Um, I feel like you would hate this book. Everything about this book would trigger you. The first page has a specific street address of the building where um, our gal, the protagonist, whose name is uh, Alex Stern, but Alex is short for galaxy. Yep, yep. That's what's happening in this book. Um, I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. It was very readable. It was very delightful. Um, and What uh, happens? Uh, I, I can't, no spoilers, but um, there's a secret society within the secret societies, Nick. There's a, okay. there's a, you know, there's always another layer of the onion. Um, there's also like some vivisection right at the beginning. Uh, so not for people um, who are squeamish, but um, Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. Uh, if you are looking for something that's beach reedy while also being goth as hell, I recommend it to you. Peter, what did you consider? I have been rereading uh, Werner Vinge's novel, Rainbow's End. This is the 2007 novel that won the Hugo Award. So Vinge died recently, but he was such a visionary and such a great writer, just a, a really enjoyable and thoughtful and uh, rigorously structured. His books are all like such so carefully structured and plotted. Um, and he was specifically a libertarian visionary, right? So he popularized the idea of the singularity. He was one of the first science fiction writers to write about brain computers computer implants and think about what uh, what that would bring to our lives and to our world. Um, and, you know, he sort of helped us think about the AI revolution that we are now on the brink of. But in Rainbow's End, he portrays the world of augmented reality. So for those of you who don't know what that is, it's kind of virtual reality that interacts with the real world. So think of uh, having glasses or goggles that, you know, uh, per- that show stuff in front of you while you're also seeing the physical world. So an overlay on top of 
the, the, the ordinary world. And so that is also a world that we are entering into now with gadgets like the Vision Pro, but also just with your iPhone, where you can point your iPhone at a sign that is written in another language and just instantly get a translation. That is an augmented reality world. Um, and this book is just incredible. It is so sharp and so smart in the ways that it lays out how AR is going to change our world. And it's it's amazing. This thing came out in 2007, before the iPhone really existed. Certainly, he was writing it before the iPhone was widely available. And he just gets so much right. He was just such a great thinker. But it's also, it's just, it's funny and it's exciting and it's thrilling. I mean, he, he's just a, a really good kind of page churning novelist. And he really primed me. I mean, that novel in particular is probably the novel that did the most to shape how I think about what I expect from the near future, the next 10 or 20 years of technology. And even, you know, not quite two decades later, going back and reading it, it is just incredibly prescient um, and, and still is giving me ideas for, for how I think the world is going to turn out. Um, so that is Werner Vinge's 2007 novel, Rainbow's End, um, RIP to a great thinker and a great writer and a great libertarian visionary. He's a really nice guy, too. I had the uh, yeah. opportunity to meet him uh, once, and he did a recent interview with uh, Mike Godwin for us that I'm sure we'll put in the show notes. Uh, very, very funny and unassuming and uh, just incredible person. So I watched the um, not opening night, the opening preview night. I don't really understand these terms, these Broadway play terms, uh, but the first performance, let's say, of a new play on Broadway called Patriots about uh, Boris Berezovsky, Russian oligarch, his sort of rise in the 1990s from a former math geek to like a huckster salesman, uh, wheeler dealer, semi-mafia guy, and it, specifically about how he started boosting the career of an unlikely uh, KGB technocrat called Vladimir Putin. And at some moment when uh, Boris Yeltsin is uh, waddling off of uh, off of the stage. Uh, Berezovsky helps promote Putin as what he thought was going to be a malleable uh, person that we could then do what we want um, in Russia, which for him, at least according to the play, was to open up to the West and maybe join NATO and do other things like that. It doesn't work out that way, as you can well imagine. Um, it first debuted on um, in London. Uh, it's written by Peter Morgan. Uh, it's terrific. It stars uh, uh, Michael Stuhlbarg, who is a great uh, actor of the theater and uh, and uh, a, a big uh, character actor in various movies. Uh, he was the lead of The Serious Man uh, by the Coen Brothers and Arnold Rothstein and Boardwalk Empire and other kinds of, of, uh, of, of performances. He's a guy I went to junior high school and high school with. He's a friend of mine. I haven't seen him on stage since 1986. <laughs> so it was awesome to watch a friend, but he's also really, really good, I swear. Um, it's not just the friend uh, discount. Um, uh, it's really interesting and fast-paced and, uh, and literate and funny. Uh, the dude who plays Putin, uh, Will Keen, brings it over from London, and he's really good. Um, and uh, just a terrific um, uh, performance. And it's was written a couple of years ago and definitely has extra bits of resonance with all the various things that have happened in the world and in Russia since then. Um, who knew that you would be interested in the character of Boris Berezovsky? And yet uh, you uh, you are. Um, and kind of the rise and fall and missed opportunities of, uh, of modern Russia. Um, but you don't need to be a super Russophile to enjoy it. It's just a very quick paced and and funny and energetic uh, play. It's called Patriots. Schulberg is one of those guys who's good in just about everything uh, and kind of stands out even in small roles. His, uh, his monologue at the end of Call Me By Your Name, the dad monologue, you can just look it up, is so good and so smart and so sort of tender in a way that you don't expect even even from the movie before it um it's really pretty remarkable also fantastic beard uh he's uh he grew a great beard for fiddler on the roof when he was 17 years old i can uh, i can uh, testify uh which is all of us were like wow it's pretty i wish i could do that to this day <laughs> uh and fun fact it was the day before or like uh, like 36 hours before his uh the performance that i saw on april 1st Got hit in the head with a rock in Central Park by a crazy bum, uh, and who he then uh, chased down the street to the Russian embassy, no less, uh, and got him arrested. 
Um, and so, uh, and then like showed up the next day for work. That sounds like a viral marketing campaign. Kind of does, frankly. I'm uh, I'm a little I'm a little sus, as the 15 year olds say. Uh, anyways, it closes. Uh, it opens officially on April 22nd. In case you want to be there on opening night, and closes in uh, in, in late June. Um, that's it. Um, okay, I can that's just all the hear him singing. If I were a rich man, in my head right now. Uh, it's uh, it's remarkable. I mean, like uh, I don't want. Don't get me started by how how fantastic of a performance that was. Um, let us now finish this podcast. Thank you for listening. Listen all Mondays, even the non-solar eclipse ones. Uh, Catherine, Mengu Ward, if you're still with us, um, I understand that there's going to be an annual Reason Weekend event that's happening pretty soon in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, do you care to tell the kids at home what a Reason Weekend is and why maybe it's possible and, uh, and preferable for them to think about attending? Yes, I would love to do that. Thank you, Matt. Um, Reason Weekend is the gathering that we host for our Torchbearer Society. You have to uh, be a generous donor to Reason at a certain threshold, and um, you get an invite. And it's a pretty cool gathering. We tend to bring in some speakers. We do some little outings. And uh, the next one is uh, the weekend of May 16th. It is in Boston, and it will feature... A live Reason Roundtable. So if you like this year podcast so much that you made it all the way to the end bits, you would probably enjoy being in Boston on May 16th to come see us do this in person. We hardly ever see each other all four in person. So it is uh, extra fun for us. And we think that that makes it extra fun for you. Um, you can find out information about this at reason.org slash events. Uh, Nick, can you give a lightning round of events happening in New York City that you find particularly enthralling? Yeah, on uh, a week from today, April 15th, we're doing a live Reason interview, a podcast taping with Jonathan Haidt. It's currently sold out, but you can get on a wait list. On May 8th, I'm doing a live Reason interview podcast with uh, Kat Murdy, who's the head of Students for Sensible Drug Policy. And on May 21st, I'll be doing an interview with Glenn Greenwald. Speaking of Russia, Matt Welch, yeah. um, in Midtown, go to reason.com slash events, and you can get information on all of those. All right. Dos vidanya, y'all, and uh, catch you next week. Goodbye. If I were a rich man, all day long, I bid a bid a bum. If I were a wealthy man